you just fix your hair and uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know we'll do that photo um feel free to uh, you know raise hands during the workshop ask questions ask questions on the chat uh, and if you want to wave to us to get our attention to ask a question that's absolutely fine as well we'd love to interact with you during this session so that's it from me uh, over to you and and sam uh, for uh, the meat of the session thanks Aaron. um Good afternoon, everybody. It's 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 morning here. It's the first thing on a Monday morning. I um, hope everybody's having a, a good summit so far. Um, as uh, Veron said, we're very happy for this to be quite interactive. We do have a few slides to go through, but um, you know, I can sense there's quite a few different um, areas that people are interested in. Um, if we can help to chat through some of your specifics, then we're happy to do that. Um, but for now, I will kick off. I'll just share my screen. Um, make sure I'm sharing the right one. There we go. Um, so yet yeah, today we are going to talk through predictive analytics and how you can specifically use predictive analytics to, to take action. Um, it's obviously quite a common theme these days, AI, ML. It's, it's everywhere, but how, how do you start? How do you approach that? Um, quick introduction to myself and Sam. So I'm Anne Sargent. Um, I head up the data science team within Lynchpin. Um, I have a background that's primarily in, in maths and, and stats back, back in my day for my sins, um, but very fortunately ended up in a consultancy um, uh, uh, agency as part of my my first job role working for um, SPSS within Ireland and within that role got a lot of exposure to different businesses with different business problems um, and using predictive analytics as sources to solve those things. Um, having uh, worked in Ireland initially came over to the UK where I actually went client side for quite a while. I worked for different companies um, such as Avis um, and Experian so primarily using really customer uh, focused analytics, who our customers are and how we can use predictive analytics to solve those problems. Um, I then moved back to consultancy business, working for Lynchpin, um, where I've been for the, the last um, seven to eight years. Um, and our team works across a, a variety of predictive analytics projects, working with business uh, professionals, looking at areas such as customer segmentation, um, marketing analysis, channel attribution, but also supplementing those with um, quite advanced um, BI and reporting functions. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about sort of the company as, as a whole in a minute. So I'll hand over to Sam to introduce himself. Yeah, um, hi everyone, um, I'm Sam. I've got uh, kind of a, a background in, in like maths and, and physics, but um, started my career kind of three years ago as a data scientist, um, works across a broad range of industries, um, working with clients like Emirates and, um, and Allergan, kind of a pharmaceutical company. Uh, in my time at Lynchpin, I've um, kind of specialized in marketing attribution and have implemented quite a few different bespoke models uh, for a number of clients. Um, and I've got quite a broad range of skills in um, a lot of tools, uh, things like Tableau and, and uh, Python, R, that kind of thing. Um, Um, so myself and Sam are part of a company called Lynchpin Analytics. We are an independent analytics consultancy. Um, essentially what that means is we are not affiliated with any one particular or tool or vendor. We um, operate um, across uh, a lot of tools. So we use a lot of open source tools, for example, R and Python um, to facilitate our analytics. Um, we work across different aspects of BI tools. So um, Tableau, Power BI, um, some of the more digital focused ones like Data Studio, um, et cetera. And we have quite a strong heritage in digital analytics as a whole as well, um, working across Adobe, Google Analytics, um, et cetera. Um, so that independence uh, enables us to have um, a very um, open view to how you and your business should be able to do your analytics. On top of that, while myself and Sam are, Sam are predominantly within the, the data science analytics aspect of the company, we have a, a very strong data engineering function. 
So our data engineers enable us to um, do all the heavy lifting with the data, tagging websites, collecting that data, and enabling that data to um, be pulled out for, for our analytics. Um, also, we have a data strategy department who um, uh, looks at the overall, the overarching uh, aspects of our, our data strategy. The agenda today is um, what is predictive analytics. So this is the core of what we're, we're looking to discuss. Um, predictive analytics, what is it and how we can take some action from it. Um, while leading up to predictive analytics, however, there are some important functions around data collection, automation and reporting and PI, which we um, realize how important that is to um, actually being able to draw action from predictive analytics. Um, we also have a bit of a focus on some specific areas of uh, predictive analytics. The, the landscape for analytics, AI and ML is huge, and I'm sure everybody is, is quite aware of all, a lot of the stuff that's, that's thrown out there at the moment. Um, today, we've thrown a very specific um, focus area on four, four areas that we believe are drawing a lot of um, action and a lot of focus on, on key, key areas within businesses at the moment. Um, and we'll talk through how we can bring that all in together to enable that within your, your customer, uh, to enable your customer understanding and to enable action within your organization. So yeah, to kick things off, um, just kind of a brief overview of what predictive analytics is. So essentially uh, what you're trying to do is uh, take historic data um, and make predictions um, for future events based off that historical data. So you pass that historical data through an algorithm um, that gives you a model. You then deploy that model and that allows you then to take new data and make predictions um, for you know, customers um, and, and what they might do in the future. So when we talk about predictive analytics, we might be talking about recommendation engines where if someone comes onto your site, um, you can then recommend particular content for them or particular products. Um, we might talk about kind of um, attribution. So like given that they are they come from a particular thing, like how, what kind of marketing will work best for them. Um, segmentation, there's lots of tools that we'll kind of go into a bit later on. Um, next slide. Um, so the importance of predictive analytics um, for businesses. So these are kind of some of the top reasons why you might look to uh, implement a predictive analytics model. So the top one here, um, identify and respond to customer trends. So um, by looking at kind of historic data and, and, and data up to the you know up to now, um, that will help you identify uh, kind of emerging trends. Um, so for instance, if you're a, a clothes retailer, you might um, you might see in the data. You might see in your dashboards and your reporting that, um, I don't know, a certain color or a certain type of um, clothing is becoming popular. And so you might then want to respond by increasing uh, the stock in that area, um, which allows you to maximize the revenue. Um, so cross sell and upsell. So again, that's kind of going back to recommendation where, um, you know, a customer comes onto your site, they, they belong to a particular segment or they, they purchased something um, in the past, like maybe they've purchased a uh, camera. Uh, so you might want to then recommend that they purchase a lens or, you know, maybe a printer to print off their, um, their photos. Um, so that can, again, like um, optimize conversion rates and, and, and really kind of maximize revenue from each, each uh, purchase. Um, another, kind of another couple of things, so understand the customer need and predict future behavior. So um, this is where you look at a customer um, and try and predict whether maybe they'll they'll churn, whether they'll continue using your product. Um, and by doing so, by predicting whether, like where they fall within your kind of customer segmentation, you can then um, personalize marketing um, to fit them. So maybe it seems like they're going to, um, to churn, maybe they're not gonna subscribe again. And so you might send out a, a kind of an offer code or something similar. Um, and then finally, kind of just extracting actual insight uh, to inform business decisions. So I guess the kind of thing that underpins predictive analytics is just drawing out insight from data. Obviously, um, looking at raw data isn't particularly interesting. It doesn't provide you a lot. So predictive analytics tries to transform that, that raw base data into um, 
very clear, very actionable uh, business decisions that ultimately will lead to higher conversion rates and um, increased revenue. And uh, what we've kind of mapped out here is the um, analytics maturity curve. So it's kind of we're trying ab uh, an abstraction of, of the process of getting from that raw data to your predictive models. Um, so on the left, kind of the first thing you might look at doing is, is automating the data. So that's pulling all of the data that you have, so your backend systems, you know, your Google Analytics or Adobe or um, kind of web data or, or what it, whatever data you have, pulling it into one central repository uh, to create that, that source of truth um, and then to clean the data and make it prepared for um, the second stage, which is kind of your reporting and insight. That's where you're building um, dashboards and, and tools that allow you to um, see the data in a kind of human readable way and will allow you to effectively draw insight for um, kind of any any person viewing it. So whether that's the C-level or whether that's kind of analysts or, or what have you. Um, third point here is predictive modeling. So once you've got those dashboards that have drawn out the insight, how can you then improve on that? Um, you can then build kind of these complex these kind of complex models that will allow you to, um, as I said earlier, kind of maximize the revenue, um, decrease churn, increase retention. Um, and then finally, optimization, which is what do I do with all the information that I've got? Uh, how do I make business decisions based off what I have? Um, and also, how do I continue to optimize my reporting, insight and analytics, my predictive models? Um, how do I make sure that I'm continuously getting all the data I need to make um, to make effective business decisions. So walking a little bit through that, I know today our core focus is predominantly on predictive analytics, but we wanted to touch base very briefly around um, two of those initial areas on the analytics maturity curve. Um, so we'll start quickly with data collection automation. Um, this is, is vast becoming one a key area that's um, helping to drive um, any general analytics functions um, and you'll see it a lot in the key trends around AI and ML. Um, anything to do around automating your data and collecting the right data is quite core to setting your, your foundations for true analytics success. Um, the, the, the impact of this is um, quite vast really. Um, we've got quite a few key functions where working with our clients we can see some quite clear benefits while data collection and automation quite can seem quite quite boring and perhaps quite well of course we need to do that um, actually when you sit down and you do that correctly you can drive some very clear benefits across your organization um, one of the key things is it does establish a single source of truth. We, we've all heard this but this is quite fundamental um, as an organization if you are drawing all of your data in and everybody's pulling from that same data lake and that data pool, then you know that you are coming to similar conclusions and, and um, have a coordinated effort in terms of the, the analysis and the insights that you're pulling across the business. Um, centralizing that data access as well is, is obviously quite key. The amount of time and effort that people put into manually pulling together data from uh, various different data sources um, can be huge. Um, working with a client and a, a very simple example um, of a graph that we see here on the right, um, pulling together their Google Analytics sources, their Google Ads, data from their business targets so that they understood how they were tracking against um, KPIs and, and um, targets and then working within the raw data within Google BigQuery, we're able to pull of the, all of that data in, process it, create a clear data lake and then push that back out through a Tableau server environment that could be interacted with um, within the entire company. Working off even just that um, initial source of data and, and that data lake became even bigger um, as time went on, pulling in many more data sources across um, Salesforce, customer, customer management tools, et cetera. Um, the initial impact from this particular client was that they had a 70% reduction in time spent gathering data. So while initially a lot of these projects may seem like um, they're not that interesting, it's hard to understand what the cost benefit analysis of it is. Um, even with that 70% reduction in time spent gathering data, actually the, the further incremental impact on the amount of revenue that you can have by now taking that time and focusing it on clear analytics that drive that drive action. 
um, it's actually hard to put money on that. Um, but that, that very simple uh, statement at the end, money saved and value gained. So spending that time putting the data into one data source and then being able to focus that on all of the analytics that, that can come after the point um, actually drives revenue in, in various different areas. So uh, second point, kind of reporting insight and analytics. So in the same way that you're trying to reduce time, um, kind of gathering and collecting data, you're also then trying to reduce the time you spend um, using that data to pr pr produce insight. Um, I'm sure we're all very familiar with like downloading CSVs and all that kind of thing, creating um, the same report over and over again. Um, so what reporting in BI is trying to do is uh, lessen that load. You know, you're trying to automate that process so that every week you go back to a report, there's nothing you need to do. The insights are there available for you to read and um, really just taking the time and the, um, the kind of monotony of getting insight out of, um, out of the kind of work life and, and pre presenting everything in a very visual and um, digestible manner. Um, so yeah, how can uh, reporting and BI help you? Um, so what reporting and BI is trying to do is combine all of the various data sources um, so that you don't have to. So, you know, you have your Google Analytics, you, are, you have your backend data, you have uh, whatever data you have on customers. Um, you have that all within one central repository and all presented in the same place. Um, something we see with a lot of clients is that they'll have um, quite a few dashboards that say the same thing, but maybe they have slightly different data sources or they have slightly different numbers. So like one dashboard might say you had 10,000 sessions a week, whereas another one might say you had like 11,000 because they're slightly different data sources that have been prepared in a slightly different way. So an effective reporting and BI implementation will ensure that you have a single source of truth. You know where to go for your insights. It's nothing that you need to do. Um, and that will really enable you to use data alongside business decisions because it's, there's not that kind of overhead in time um, to get those to get those insights. Um, so the core of what we really want to talk about today, however, is, is the predictive modeling area. Um, as I mentioned, the, the landscape at the moment is vast. Um, you go out there and look at what the marketing trends for for the, the next year uh, alone can be, you can you can stumble into areas such as, you know, what the impact of voice search is, you know, chatbots, augmented reality. Um, it, and it, it, it seems quite daunting. Um, this is what we have found. We've, we've been working with clients for quite a, a number of years and working with clients across a lot of different, different industries. Um, you know, for example, working with Emirates in, in the airline industry. Um, in the UK, we have John Lewis, who's a, a, as part of the actual big financial services area. Um, John Lewis has, has some key areas in, in insurance um, that we work across. Um, and we have uh, quite a lot of B2B clients. Actually, there can be quite a lot of big common trend of some of the key analytics that we use quite regularly that drives a lot of value within the company um, and enables further uh, advanced analytics um, as they move forward. So here are the key areas that we've, we've touched on today. Um, we're gonna to talk a little bit about recommendation engines, um, customer segmentation to help drive that clear, clear personalization, um, understanding your true customer value, uh, lifetime value, and then talk a bit about marketing attribution. So with a very specific focus on um, a lot of our clients work on actually understanding that customer journey. Um, for anybody who's not aware, a recommendation engines um, actually can have uh, a big impact across a lot of areas. Um, they're typically described as machine learning algorithms, um, which look to provide um, relevant items to, to, the, to the user. So those items can either be whether you want to cross sell uh, a different product. So we know what the current products that customer likes or is viewing. And we want to understand what is the next best item to um, present to them. It could also be content. So customer is viewing your content, their interest in particular areas of your website, what's the next best piece of content to, to deliver to them. Um, and it could be vast different things. So actually you can do that real time as well. So while customers are, are actively interacting with your um, 
your advertising and your content and your products, how, what is the next best, best action we can take to that? So recommendations engines in themselves can be can be drawn out into quite a, a various ways of, of pushing uh, actionable analytics across your industry. Um, the benefits of recommendation engines can be seen across um, various KPIs within your company as well. So whether that's your online conversion rates, um, whether that's driving clear revenue by um, increasing your average order value, or whether that's by improving your customer relationships with um, driving overall customer lifetime value. So personalization is, is key to um, creating a relevant journey for your customers. Um, recommendation engines actually can be developed in um, various different ways. Um, again, I think predictive analytics can sometimes feel like it's, it's uh, a step that's too far at the moment, depending on your particular analytics maturity. However, we have um, actually started off quite small with some clients and using um, advanced BI as opposed to going straight into um, machine learning algorithms, um, understanding the data, pulling them into cross-sell dashboards, for example, and understanding the, the general um, impact of one product um, versus another. Um, and a, a clear example of this is for a client who is looking at their initial product holdings of customers um, develop some very simple cross-sell dashboards um, and by focusing that in on um, key areas of high value items um, they were able to identify uh, an incremental 40,000 euros um, for every 1% uplift in conversion that they could gain so that gave um, the uh, e-commerce area of the business very clear focus on where to look within their product holdings and what customers to target. You can actually become more advanced, however, so pushing that into um, your machine learning algorithms, you can develop some market basket analysis, which again can be a, a clear focus on products, but can actually also be um, pushed into um, what is the, the, the best combination of content. So uh, again, using a very similar approach, um, market basket analysis and, and spade algorithms, um, some companies were able to uplift their online conversion by 4%, um, and that is purely by looking at the content that the customer was looking to interact with next. Um, recommendation analysis can also be done as a, as a pure propensity modeling exercise. So who are our customers? What do they have? And can we um, identify the, the highest propensity for uh, product A to be uh, uptaken next. That can be pushed into customer marketing emails to um, clearly focus uh, relevant messaging to, to customers at the right time. Um, so recommendation engines are often talked about in terms of that on-site personalization. However, the applications can be huge across your business. You can push that out into your products. You can optimize your content. Um, you can you can look at prom promotional bundles. So what, what bundles of promotions can go next um, and then uh, truly understand the next best action. Is there any questions? Um, so kind of following, uh, following on from recommendation um, kind of customer segmentation, uh, which is essentially uh, where you try and divide your customer base um, based on on certain characteristics, you know that might be geography, um, the kind of the lifestyle they lead, uh, the demographics, um, and then personalizing their experience, whether that's on your site. Um, you could also be personalizing the communications that you send out to them, so the emails. Um, there's lots lots of different things you can do there. Um, so, for example, a kind of a classic example might be like if you're an airline. Um, you might like to divide uh, the customer base by the business travelers or the, the holiday makers um, and according to which uh, customer base they fall into. Um, so if you see that someone's come onto your site and they're maybe only they're kind of coming on a Monday and leaving on a Tuesday, you might determine that they're a business customer and therefore maybe they'd like to have um, a priority um, ticket for like queuing and such so that they don't have to spend much time in the airport. Um, equally, if you see that like a kind of uh, two adults and, and two kids um, is kind of like um, come onto your site, maybe you'd want to um, suggest that they have a meal on the flight, you know, or um, that kind of thing. So it's all about trying to drive revenue and personalize um, 
personalized content um, because that really goes a long way to actually increasing revenue and increasing conversion. And, um, and also things like retention, you know, you'll get better, better customer, uh, customer retention uh, this way. Uh, so a couple of examples of, of ways you can segment your customer base. Uh, it's typically applied uh, behavioral, demographic, geographic, or kind of lifestyle level. Um, at the bottom here, got kind of a classic behavioral um, customer segmentation method, uh, the RFM model, which is recency, frequency, and monetary. So by looking at how uh, recently someone's converted and also the frequency with it, with it, with which they tend to convert and also their kind of um, average transaction value, you might like to, um, to you know, kind of communicate with them differently. So for instance, uh, if someone's a very new customer, so they haven't purchased with you very frequently, this is their first uh, purchase. Um, if someone's a new customer, you might um, provide them with onboarding support. So that might be sending them an email, like how do you use their service? How to make the most of your, how do they make the most of your service? So start building that relationship and start, you know, making them feel at home um, with your business. However, if someone uh, is has bought with you very recently, but they also buy uh, your product very frequently and they have a very high transaction value, uh, you might like to reward them uh, to keep them these are your, your, your champions, you know, the people who will go out and, and proselytize and, and will kind of tell their friends about, about your products. Um, so it's important to keep them in your customer base and then it's important to reward them as well. We all know how frustrating it can be when you're with a, uh, a company for 10 years and you feel like all the new customers are getting the rewards, but, but what, what, what are you getting? Um, so that might lead you then to, to leave. Whereas if you're constantly being um, rewarded for, for being a loyal customer and a, a champion of the product, um, you're much less likely to uh, to actually leave. Uh... Um, so the next key area that we're seeing um, quite a big uptake on um, within a lot of our clients at the moment is a, cost, a focus on customer lifetime value. Um, in some ways, it's a very simple definition, uh, and in in some ways, it is can also be a very simple application. Um, essentially, it's just looking at the value that that customer contributes over the lifetime of the company. Um, so we're all aware and we probably all do a lot of ROI metrics um, where we look at that initial transactional value customer comes in. We spend X amount um, via PPC to, to gain them and they spend £20 on, on a product and you know we can calculate our ROI here. However, different customers have very different customer lifecycle journeys. Um, some customers can, can start slow, but actually become very loyal customers over, over a period of time. Other customers can come in, spend a lot of money and, and never come back to us again. Um, so the, the, the function, the understanding of what a customer life cycle um, is for each individual customer um, can actually become quite complicated, but also extremely important to really understand what the true value of our customers are over time. Um, there's various ways that you can approach customer lifetime value. Um, and there are various different um, uh, equations that you, you can apply to it. Um, you can actually start quite simple and you can get quite complicated. I think the, the key area that we would like to, to pull out today is that, you know, don't be afraid to start. Um, you can start with those very simple equations, um, taking that first step forward and understanding uh, at least what the potential for a, a longer lifetime value might be gives you that uh, very initial uh, and powerful um, formula to, to understand your customers better. Um, the way to truly make customer lifetime value um, actionable is to coordinate it across the multiple areas of your business. Customer lifetime value is not one of those areas that sort of has a very specific focus on one um, metric. It can be seen um, across the business. So make sure that you look at all the strategies where customer lifetime value might be impacted. For example, you know, bringing your customers in, are you bringing in the right customers and acquiring the right customers in the first place? Um, retaining those customers, how do you create that customer relationship strategy to, to identify those clear high value customers at the start and then uh, um, encourage that relationship? Or how do you deal with the customers who are looking at, at like their low value? Um, you know, what relationship do you develop with these guys? And you know, how does that actually push out into different aspects of product development um, and promotional strategies? Um, 
Similarly, within your financial modeling, customer lifetime value can have can have huge, huge impact. Um, so it's one of those areas that um, actually can be approached in so many different ways and has um, a lot of benefits. Um, the key thing for you and your business is to truly understand what are the key levers that might drive your customer lifetime value. Um, for you know, one example here is that you focus in on those areas that within your business that you understand actually uh, impacts your customer. So to, to, to turn the dial, to shift the dial, you might be looking at how can you increase the revenue? Um, how can you improve how long that they stay with you? Um, but also how can you reduce the costs to, to servicing that customer and or acquiring that customer? Um, we'll talk a little bit more about lifetime value towards the end, but um, it's a very powerful piece of um, your actionable analytics. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about marketing attribution. I'm sure something that uh, you've all heard, um, heard about. Um, essentially what we're trying to do with marketing attribution is, is understand the customer journey, understand what's driving them to, to your products and, and what's then you know, keeping them and, and, and actually getting them to, to convert. Um, so what, we, what we'll do here is attribute, we'll try and attribute value to each of these marketing interactions. So maybe you want to know how much is that uh, sports sponsorship, you know, um, worth, like how much is that actually driving awareness? How much is that driving people to your site? How much is that billboard that you have on the side of a, side of a road um, worth spending, um, spending on? Um, and then once you've got a good view of the customer journey and what people are clicking through, what kind of marketing channels people are using, uh, you can then start optimizing that marketing spend. So that's where you say, okay, maybe I'm oversaturating my uh, my billboard spend, right? Maybe we've got like billboards all over all over the city and, and people aren't responding to it. And so maybe we can shift some of that to uh, maybe a PPC campaign, you know, get some paid search going or, or some display. Um, and then kind of finally, you've got the, the intra-channel optimization. So that's where you look within so you might look within your PPC landscape, your paid search landscape, and you might say, these keyword, keywords are performing particularly well. This campaign didn't perform that well. Maybe we could try a different, um, you know, try different content, uh, something similar to that. So marketing attribution is essentially helping you understand that customer journey in full and then make decisions to uh, enable more effective marketing and, and increase ROI um, for your marketing spend. Um, so yeah, first, how, how do I go about attributing value to marketing interactions? So um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with uh, econometric techniques. This is where we might um, try and use historic data, a load of various um, variables, like you might use all of your marketing spend data and your revenue data together to try and understand um, those offline touch points. Um, so you, know, you might use regression techniques to understand because you can't actually see someone who goes, who sees a billboard, um, who then goes onto your site, you won't, you don't know that they've come, they've seen that billboard. You don't know it's that billboard that's driven the awareness. So by using these econometric techniques, you can actually kind of infer um, who has come through and, and the response of, of spending that money um, in revenue. And then when we talk about the kind of online um, techniques, when someone actually visits your site, we can actually see that in the data. So we can see if someone's come through a PPC click or a display click, display click. Then you have the question about, you know, which click do you attribute value to? Um, kind of typical model is the last interaction, which is where um, it's the most recent interaction that gets the value. So if someone clicks through a display or maybe like a Facebook page, clicks through to your site, but then doesn't convert and then laterally types in your company name and then clicks through um, and then converts. It's that final click that would get the, the value, the, the, the full value of the conversion, but maybe it should actually be that display ad that gave them the awareness in the first place. So that's where we start looking at um, more data-driven approaches, uh, where you start talking about like markup models and, and Shapley models, um, where that value is, tr is um, attributed in a more fair way. And this is where like a lot of um, marketing can be undervalued or indeed overvalued. and. and um, companies can spend too much in one area and, and neglect another area, despite the fact that that is actually driving that awareness, um, which is you know a necessary part of the customer funnel. Sorry, any, any, any questions on that last slide? 
Um, so yeah, secondly, uh, once you've got that attribution model, uh, what do you do with it? You know, what do you do with the, the revenue data? Like when, when we say you've got, you know, uh, a million uh, generated revenue from your PPC spend, what, what do you do? Um, so something we've done with quite a few clients now is build um, a kind of spend optimizer. This is something that looks at the revenue across your all of your marketing channels. So in the dashboard on the bottom left, the, um, this client had um, kind of six channels. They had their display channels, they had their PPC channels, their social channels. And um, what we look at doing is understanding how close to saturation are they for, um, for each of those channels. So are they spending enough in PPC or are they spending too much in display? And um, on, the, on the bottom right, you have the marketing spend optimizer, which is where we built this tool that allows um, the marketing user to um, put in uh, their budget. Um, put in some spend constraints. So um, do they want to spend in a certain area? Do they want to test in another area? Um, and then what it will do, what the spend optimizer will do is look at all of the different, um, look at all of the different channels, look at all the different spend curves and uh, recommend a spend accordingly and recommend the spend that will provide the highest revenue and the highest number of orders. Um, and so, yeah, you also then, as a result of that, get a predicted revenue um, for a marketing spend. Um, and then we have the optimizing kind of intra-channel. So this is where um, you build out uh, reporting suites that will allow you to see, you know, how are your PPC campaigns performing? How are your display campaigns performing? So this is taking data from uh, Google Analytics or Adobe or wherever you have that data and uh, presenting it in a way that will allow you to optimize your, your PPC campaigns or your uh, display campaigns or, or whatever. Um, so you'll see that, you know, if, if, taking the PPC example, you'll see a list of keywords and your list of your campaigns, and you'll see the, the response you're getting from, from the customer base. You'll see, you know, what revenue, maybe certain keywords aren't driving any conversions. And so you'll then move that spend from, from one of those keywords to maybe another keyword that is actually getting high, high number of conversions, high number of click-throughs. Um, these dashboards also will allow you to see that kind of the search space as well. Um, so like how many impressions are you getting for a particular keyword and, and, and what's your kind of market share there? So the final part of our analytics and maturity curve was around optimization. Um, just to revisit that analytics and maturity curve and, and as it currently stands, some people may have seen this before. Um, it, it um, starts with your data automation, collecting your data, understanding what happened, um, and moving through some more advanced uh, aspects of insight analytics, predictive modeling, and then how, how do you bring that all together? Um, what I think is misrepresented by this, this curve is that actually the journey towards optimization is not linear. Um, you do not need to have to do all of these steps in order to get to a very clear optimization um, aspect of your uh, journey. And you don't need to have everything absolutely perfect down here in order to be able to begin your predictive modeling. Um, we've approached um, a lot of different actionable analytics, either predictive or, or through reporting and insight. And um, that drives a lot of value in the business. Um, ultimately, what we believe optimization is, is adapting each aspect of um, your core your core strategy. So, you know, bringing your data in, understanding it and collecting it, drawing out that insight, um, bringing that across the business so everybody shares and understands what's what's happening um, and enabling those predictive analytics. Um, as I said, just because you don't have the full, the full data lake set up and running yet doesn't mean that you can't start with your predictive analytics by beginning with some nice simple models, focusing in on some key areas and rev revenue driving projects, you can understand your data gaps and push that back into your data collection and your data automation functions. Um, by drawing out your insight and understanding your, your customer understanding, your, um, your BI and your analytics, you can then push that into your, your predictive analytics and, and vice versa. All of these things operate in tandem to each other. Um, and overarching that, what you really need to do is have a, a data strategy um, that um, encapsulates everything that you want to do. So where are you looking to drive as a business? 
um, what is your your vision at the end of of each project or, or all of the projects you know what is your your main um, business goal um, and we're all aware that when, once once we start reporting up into the business there's probably only two two or three um, real KPIs that people care about um, depending on your business whether that's that's revenue or or people or content or engagement um, there's some really key, key focus areas so start driving those predictive analytics now um, and draw out that insight and just to, to sort of pull this all together, um, the reality of um, any of your um, analytics projects, whether they be predictive or, or driven by more, more insight, um, is that what they really should do is work together. So I've got a case study here, which draws on a, a lot of the things that we've discussed, um, LTV being one sort of the, the core focus areas on it. Um, this is an example of a customer who came to us and identified um, a key area that they felt needed addressing, um, and it was, you know, simply customer churn. Um, you could sit down and approach that with some churn propensity models, um, you know, nice, I say simple, um, a nice focus project. Let's look at our customer churn and let's see if we can identify which customers are about to churn and change that metric into something that um, is more beneficial to the business. However, actually, when you look at that with a bit of an overarching um, strategy, you understand that churn is impacted in many different areas of the business and by many different um, metrics that go around it. Um, what we did is we brought together a, um, a workshop um, with people across the business. So we drew in the um, customer acquisition team. Um, customer acquisition team thought, why do I care about customer churn? My KPIs are um, acquisition, bringing customers in. Um, you know, we brought in the customer marketing team who were quite key to um, having that relationship and that conversation with the customers. Um, we brought in people from billings and finance to understand some of the different metrics. Um, and we also brought in, in this particular, uh, particular client, um, the contact centers where they had that final conversation with the customer. Um, what you will tend to find across your business is that there can be a lot of different competing um, KPIs uh, and sometimes by working within one aspect of your industry or one aspect of your, your um, business um, that can also that can have a negative impact in, on other KPIs. So when we were looking at um, all of the different metrics, we realized that this, this was multifaceted. How we did it was that we switched it from customer churn to looking at customer retention. Um, so how do we turn this into a positive retaining, retaining customers and then advancing that out into how do we retain the right customers? Um, so we actually developed multiple models um, to, to look at what was initially a customer churn focus. Um, so we built out an LTV um, to understand who our customers are, um, what value they drive to us and how we can actually focus in our, our strategies on the high value customers. Um, we build um, churn prediction models as well. So we did do the propensity models that understood how and when customers were about to, to churn. Um, but we also worked within the contact center um, to understand how that we can push um, the, the impact of, if I know a customer is about to churn, what can I do about it? Because knowing a customer is about to churn is, is only one aspect. I need to understand how I can talk to that customer. Um, so we also incorporated um, segmentation. So segmentation and understanding our customers allowed us to have the conversation using the, the tone of voice to the different customer, customer segments. Um, and this actually had an impact across multiple metrics within the industry. Um, as you can see here, lifetime value was increased by 3%. Overall churn was reduced by 18%. Um, but also, also other complementary metrics such as um, how the contact center was able to save the right customers, um, help them to, to improve their metrics as well. I think we've got a hand up, is that correct? Okay, I'll, I think I've only got one slide left, so... Um, in, in a nutshell, we've, we've focused on some very clear predictive analytics um, models today, um, but the, the key takeouts that we would like you to, to take away from today is that don't think that the journey to more advanced analytics needs to be quite a linear one and that you need to put into place 
a lot of data automation, a lot of data collection, um, and, and set that reporting in BI up. You can start your predictive analytics journeys now, even incorporating some, some initial dashboards and explorations. You can start building out your, your cross-sell models or your, your RFM matrix to understand your, your, your basic customer segments. Um, adopt a data science approach. And by that, what, I'm, what I mean is to, to truly understand the journey from start to finish. Don't just focus on the models themselves. The BI and the insight that comes with it is just as important and sometimes more important than the model that actually comes out the other end. Understand your models, build the models for you and your business. Um, there are lots of black box models that you can just pick off the shelf, but actually when you want to um, use that within your business and to optimize to your metrics, you find that um, there's a lot of customization that needs to happen. Um, and make sure that the insights to those models are actually easy to understand and stuff that you can talk to around the business because, um, you know, in that last example, churn in itself might have been a, a very simple churn model that um, had a, a one, one particular output, by, but by bringing that insights across the business, you can actually start to pull the levers in, on many different metrics that um, then coordinate and, and pull together. And don't be afraid get started, start doing those predictive models. Um, even if you have small data sources now, um, one step forward is, is, uh, is, is a game. So, so that's it um, from us. Um, happy to take questions. I'm conscious that we're uh, having a lot of time. I'm not sure I can see the chat function, but hopefully somebody will help me if there's some questions. If anybody has any questions, you can just go ahead and unmute yourself as well. Um, else you can just put it in the chat. Okay, um, and we have a question from Samuel. Um, any comments on the model extensions of clumpiness and cohort effects? So can you repeat that question? Yeah, any comments on the model extensions of clumpiness and cohort effects? Um, hang on, let me just escape from this. Sam, have you got? Like clumpiness. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure um, what you mean by that, Samuel. Maybe, uh, maybe if you could. Oh, hang on, I can see. Maybe you could expand on that. Hi, Sam. Have you got some specific um, aspects of, of that that you're you're looking to understand? Samuel, I can see that your microphone is on, but we can't hear you, unfortunately. I, I, I'm not sure that you know, this is something that we, we understand enough about Samuel in order to, to understand this specifically what you're, you're looking to attempt. I'm more than happy to have a follow up conversation. Um, but yeah, this is quite a, 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 broad, a broad question. Um, should we focus on large buying customers rather than attaining uh, new customers? Um, if, if I understand this question correctly, Sam, um, large buying customers, 
that ultimately comes down to your business and what you're looking to do with within that business. Um, there's many different approaches that you can take to, to whether you're looking at customer acquisition at that point in time. Um, you certainly can't not look at customer acquisition um, depending on what position your company is in. If you're quite new, you want to acquire customers, you want to bring those customers in and you want to, to get that customer base up as quickly as possible. Um, I certainly wouldn't um, recommend that you, you start narrow. Um, we can't understand who our natural customers are unless we, unless we let them in the door and analyze them and understand who, who they are and what their needs are. Um, so attaining new customers is quite key. Um, understanding who those customers are is even more important. Um, and that's where you have the combination of analytics. So what, what value are they driving? Um, you know, how do they like to be spoken to? What behavior or characteristics do they have through your segmentation? And how do they move through your RFM matrix? Um, I guess another, another aspect of, of that, um, that, that, that type of cohort analysis, for example, is how do you actually push somebody who today looks like they could be low value and only interacting a certain way? How can we encourage that relationship to be more, be more high value in the future? Um, so it's 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 not a simple question to answer. It's not just say one size fits all, but it's you know how does that fit for your strategy? How do you optimize your analytics? And and yeah, just to add on to that, I think that's something that you try and focus on with you know your customer lifetime value models where you try and assess you know the value of a customer and, and which kind of segments you're trying to to gain and who are the most valuable customers to you so that's something that would would hopefully come out of those kind of models okay no worries sorry Sam. No worries. I'm have a follow-up conversation with with you afterwards if if you'd like to <laughs> um yeah and, and and if anybody does want to follow up with us afterwards i'm sure our um we can we can share our details Any further questions? No? Okay, awesome. I think Basil has also just said um, thank you so much. Um, he's put it in the chat as well. Um, if everybody could just turn on that video for a second. So did someone say something? Okay, awesome. So we'll just take a picture for social media. One, two, three, and cheese. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Anne and Sam, for the lovely session. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the trip. Thanks, Sam. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Sam. Thank you.